St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he's 92 years young. Uh, his father fought in World War I and brought, a, brought home a French war bride. Together they had four children, Paul being the second from the oldest. When Paul was a small child, his father died. This was before the social safety nets the government has in place today, so being unable to afford food for all four children, Paul's mother took his older brother and Paul to a Catholic or orphanage in St. Louis where Paul lived until he joined the U.S. Army at the age of 17. Uh, he told, told the Army he was 18. He had to be 18. Uh, so they would let him uh, en enlist. He was five foot six and weighed 135 pounds at the time. He completed his basic training in the 2nd Armored Division that would become known as the famous Hell on Wheels while fighting Hitler's Army in North Africa and Europe. By the time Paul was uh, 18, he was a pl platoon sergeant leading men in combat. He fought in all seven campaigns and all three invasions, including Normandy, which you might recall from the opening scenes of the movie Saving Private Ryan. He spent the next five Christmases away from home and four of them on the front lines. He was wounded twice. Both wounds qualified Paul to leave the army with a medical discharge, but he chose to return to the front line both times, refusing to leave his band of brothers under his command until the war was over and they could all go home together. His actions in service to America earned him two Purple Hearts, three Bronze Stars, a Silver Star. He was knighted by the country of France, which is the equivalent of the American Medal of Honor. Are you kidding me? <laughs> is that amazing? And he accomplished all of this between the ages of 17 and 22. He's also in the Oklahoma Military Hall of Fame and currently a movie called Fury uh, starring Brad Pitt, among others, is scheduled to be released later this uh, year, I think coming out in mid-November, that chronicles the exploits of the Hell on Wheels soldier. Paul was a consultant on this movie in his book, uh, Unless You Were There, which is this one right here, and he has copies over here on the table, which is a great book. Um, the, the, his book was used by the writers to help capture the historical integrity of the movie. Uh, we should all live our lives in such a way that others would choose to make a movie about our deeds. Would you please join me in welcoming a true American hero, Mr. Paul Ender. Uh, I have never received an introduction like this. Uh, we, uh, what we usually do is uh, just go to the schools and just have a few minutes and, uh, and we start off right away because uh, 30 months is a long time to cover. So uh, we'll be uh, putting up some of the stuff on the board and I'll be going along with it the best I can. Uh, you folks are very professional. Uh, we're not. <laughs> so uh, we'll try to, try to do it the way, uh, the best way we can. And so uh, hang in there. Or, so, uh, 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 yeah, uh, they said I was uh, 135 pounds, but Craig made a mistake. I was only 117 pounds. And so, uh, anyway, uh, uh, when I, uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, January 2nd, uh, 1923, and you can move that on. And, uh, okay, I, I joined the Army at 17. Uh, supposed to have been 18, lied about my age, and uh, they uh, uh, told me that they, they wouldn't take me unless I went home to have my mother sign the papers that I was 18, and so she did because I had to get rid of some of us because there were too many boys at home for us, and so uh, I, I, uh, I went, and they, uh, they said, uh, number one, they said you can't, uh, you're too little, so you, uh, you have to take the uh, or infantry or the uh, medical corps, and I didn't want the medical corps, and I thought I loved guns, so I said I'll take the infantry, and I, I advise everybody to stay out of the infantry. But anyway, uh, uh, we uh, went into training at Fort Benning, uh, at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, under the old way, no uh, uh, boot camp or anything like that in that day, because the the draft hadn't started yet, so that was a year and a half before Pearl Harbor was in May 40. So uh, we trained in our own group at uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, and 
and from Jefferson Parish, Missouri, we moved to Fort Benning, Georgia, and the, my group, the 6th Infantry, was divided up, and a part of us was sent to Fort Benning to be the infantry for the 2nd Armored Division. The other part of our group was sent to uh, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, to be part of the 1st Armored Division. And so, uh, training at Fort Benning, very quickly, uh, we uh, uh, had General Patton was our first, uh, was our second division commander there, and he did a lot of things and uh, and uh, informed us as to how we were to act. And of course, uh, you all know uh, Patton was not uh, a very nice man. Uh, we always uh, called him the SOB, and uh, and uh, but he made us mad and he made us better fighters. And his rule always was kill or be killed. And so. Uh, and he says, let the other guy die for his country, don't you die for yours. <laughs> Get down in the dirt with the enemy and fight their war, not the one you've been taught in the States, the one that the Germans have been taught on how to beat you. And uh, so you get down in the dirt with them and let them know that you could be just as dirty as they were and you could whip them. And so the Americans did whip them, as you know. We invaded French Morocco in 19, uh, November 1942. The main thing I want to say about French Morocco is uh, the first time you could get all the training you ever want and uh, go under barbed wire, carry loads and everything, <laughs> but whether you're a leader or not will tell when that first bullet goes past your ear. You're either going to be scared or, and, well you're always scared, but you're going to be scared in a different way. And I can always remember when I hit the dirt, I said, what in the hell are you doing here to myself? And I was a platoon sergeant already at that time. And so uh, uh, I knew that Patton's orders were, uh, you can't hit a, a station, you can't hit a moving target, so get up and move. So we got up and moved, and we did the job in French Morocco. Uh, after French Morocco, uh, we moved to the, uh, 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 Rabat to the forest in Rabat, and uh, we, uh, I was uh, fortunate to be an honor guard at the Casablanca Conference, where I met Roosevelt, Churchill, uh, Eisenhower, General Clark, and uh, even the King of England, and the two French generals, Du Gaulle and Giraud. And so uh, I was right among them, and so uh, that was uh, quite a deal to get to see all those guys. At the Casablanca Conference, the Sultan of Morocco gave me a badge from their from their troops and uh, I have it on my board as a souvenir. Uh, after the Casablanca conference of uh, the Catherine Pass situation happened, the Catherine Pass situation was uh, where uh, the first armored division was there. We were behind them and uh, uh, they did not do what we were always taught to do: take the high ground. And if you don't take the high ground, the enemy's up there. You can see everything you're doing. So the 1st Armored Division lost over a thousand vehicles and thousands of men captured. So we were sent up there to rebuild the Catherine Pass. So the first thing we had to do, act as infantry and take the high ground first. So then we went through Catherine Pass and, and uh, we move on from Catherine Pass to the Tunisia campaign. Patton was uh, sent up there with us. Uh, uh, and uh, we stayed up there for a while, and uh, we had to withdraw from the Tunisian campaign and go to Arzu, uh, uh, North Africa, to prepare for the Sicilian invasion. So uh, uh, Patton also withdrew from the campaign in Tunisia and was with us for the, uh, uh, the invasion of Sicily. You can move that on there. Okay. Uh, uh, Sicily invasion, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, I try to give you the highlights of each campaign so that we can move on. Uh, the, the Sicilian campaign, the very first thing that I'll never forget is uh, we landed at Gila, French Morocco, uh, at Gila, Sicily, and we were assigned to work with the uh, uh, Darby's Rangers, the 4th Ranger Battalion, and uh, we uh, uh, got in, involved, uh, well, just before that, they told us that the, uh, during the invasion that the American paratroopers would be flying over the convoy and dropping paratroopers on a certain night at a certain time. Uh, 
See, just before that, the Germans controlled the air, so they were they were dropping bombs on the fleet. And so uh, about an hour before that was to happen, our planes were to come over, the Germans were there, and we were firing all over. And so uh, as a result of that, we were worried that when our planes came over, they would keep firing. So uh, we held our breath, and so we were on the beach at the time, looking up, and the first group of... Uh, our planes came over to C-47 with the paratroopers and they got over without anybody firing. And we said, great, that's, that's a wonderful thing that they're not gonna fire. The second group came over and somebody got an itchy finger out in the convoy and he opened fire. We shot down 22 of our own planes, killed 82 paratroopers, their bodies floated in the next morning. Plus, all together, they told us after they counted everything, we killed 232 American paratroopers at the Sicilian invasion. They did not tell the people about it in the United States until October, because they were afraid the way the people would react. Today, of course, they'd know 15 minutes after it would happen, it'd be all over the news, because they, they have reporters or politicians. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, we took the town of Butera, uh, was up on a mountain, uh, climbing that, uh, we weren't mountain troops, but we were with the 4th Ranger Battalion, so we're climbing the mountain, and uh, all the while we're climbing, the heavy shells were dropping from the battleships out at sea, because it was only seven miles to the top of the Butera, and it was the highest point that we had to take it. So going up the mountain, we had a Baptist chaplain with us. And he would say, now boys, now boys, he was always hollering because we were cussing the whole time. <laughs> and uh, we, one of the boys turned to him and he says, boys, hell, chaplain. He says, when we die and we go up there and St. Peter says, where did you serve? We're going to say in the infantry. And he's going to say, pass on through, you already served your time in hell. <laughs> anyway, uh, I thought you'd like that. <laughs> From there, we went on through Sicily. A lot of stories there, but we don't have time for that right now. Uh, you'd have to read the book. Uh, but anyway, uh, it mentions the minefields uh, there. But I, I've got to cover the minefield before I go to the invasion. Uh, the minefields in... in uh, uh, we the peace developed in Sicily. We took Sicily and we moved into an area where we were going to rest. And we again fouled up. We did not do what we were supposed to do. We didn't check for mines. So we we were in the minefield and we weren't sure. Uh, we didn't know it. And I was leading the kitchen truck in there because we went in on foot. And I, I'm leading the kitchen truck in there. I'm standing on the running board and then we hit a mine and the truck blows up. So I'm flying through the air and landed somewhere. I was all right, though. And, uh, <laughs> so anyway, we found out we were in a minefield and had to clear the minefield before uh, we went and did anything further. And how we cleared the minefield is another interesting thing, but uh, we can't go into all that detail. We went to England. Uh, we turned in all of our equipment in Sicily, and we thought that uh, what was going to happen uh, uh, we were going to go somewhere uh, else, but we, we didn't. We thought we were going to the Asian side, but we didn't. We headed out through Gibraltar and we're headed uh, towards the United States. And we said we can't be going home all, already because in those days you stayed there till it was over or you got shot. So, uh, anyhow, uh, three days long we turned north and they said you're going to the United, all right, but not the United States. You're going to the United Kingdom. So we went and landed in England in uh, November of 43, uh, just in time for Thanksgiving. We had good Thanksgiving. Uh, we enjoyed the English girls because they could speak English and we'd been in two places where they didn't speak English and so uh, it was easier to get along with them. And uh, I did have four girlfriends there. And I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't married at the time. <laughs> So uh, we prepared for the invasion of, uh, of Normandy, and uh, uh, my group went in right behind the 29th uh, Infantry Division, who was brand new. They didn't have much experience, so uh, uh, we were very concerned for them because we knew that they would be facing fire for the first time, and that made a lot of difference because we'd been under fire before. 
and uh, some of the others on the other beaches had been under fire, but not the 29. So they were right in front of us, and they lost 2,000 men there, right in that area there, on the first day. And so <laughs> our job was to get in because we were armored then and traveling with tanks. And so our job was to find a place for the tanks and to get them settled and to uh, move up to the Bar River to help the paratroopers. The paratroopers were, had been dropped a day or two before and uh, of course they did not uh, have much ammunition or anything like that. They could only carry what they could jump out of the plane with. So uh, our job was to get them supplied and to help them to secure the Bar River area. And uh, from there we moved down from the Bar River to the hedgerow fighting and we got involved in the hedgerows. Quite a deal about head growth, but I'll only tell you one thing that I think is that you need to know is uh, uh, I was with a telescope going through the group of trees opposite another head row, and uh, <clears throat> I run across a guy who was aiming his weapon right between my eyes. So I dropped down right away, and everybody around me dropped down, and the bullet came right through and uh, missed me. Of course, I'm here. But uh, anyway, I call on mortar fire for that row, and we drop mortars in there and the guys come falling out of the trees and with them were some French women, at least three of them as I recall. <laughs> and they had been uh, their boyfriend, girlfriend, because they were there since 1939, you remember. So some of the girls stick up with the Germans. And so they were shooting at us too. So when we captured these women, we turned them over to the French. The French shaved their hair and made them stay with the city that they were born in, hair shaven for the whole war, to denote that they were traitors. And that was had to be a tough job for those women, and uh, that probably was the best thing that they, that they could have done to them, more than we could have done. Uh, and give me another one there, let's see what else. Okay, uh, that's another D-Day deal. Uh, uh, that's an LST where they're uh, getting ready to unload uh, the different uh, uh, equipment. Go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, after, uh, after we uh, finished in the uh, hedgerows, uh, well, there was stories about the hedgerows, but you'll have to read the book. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, we went to, uh, to an area called Comand, and we relieved the British for a while so that they could help uh, Montgomery at Con. And so uh, after we were there for a few days, or a couple of weeks it was, that was some good stories about that one too, but I, I'm gonna go past them, read the book. So anyway, um, we went to the Cerisi Forest, and in there we were all to get haircuts, and so uh, the way we got haircuts is anybody with a scissors, you sat down and he cut your hair any way he wanted to. And so uh, um, we, we got a haircut. We, uh, we were told to put on camouflage uniforms. And so we put on camouflage uh, fatigue clothes that were painted. And uh, so somebody woke up uh, and says, hey, you can't do that. The Germans wear camouflage and they're going to be mistaken for camouflage. I mean, for Germans. I'll just say low breakthrough, we called it. So anyway, they told everybody, take off your camouflage uniform. We didn't, because we were already moving. The 2nd Armored Division was already moving towards St. Louis, so we went in camouflage. And we're the only American troops that were in the St. Louis breakthrough in camouflage. And so uh, anyway, uh, we in in incurred a, quite a, oh, during the St. Lo breakthrough, we had a thousand plane raid over St. Lo. It takes 24 hours for a thousand planes, dropping bombs all the time. And uh, during that, one of the group of planes made a mistake and they dropped the bombs on us. Uh, just to the right of us a little ways, uh, Third Armored and some of the other infantry outfits, and they killed somewhere, I forgot now, maybe up to uh, 300 or something like that. And, uh, and General McNair was killed there, the, old, the highest ranking general in World War II that was there observing the St. Lo breakthrough and he was killed there. And so uh, anyway, we went on through the St. Lo breakthrough. Uh, <clears throat> we went to a town called Pomprocard. In Pomprocard we had two fights there. 
pretty tough ones, and uh, I, I need to mention this one because between the two fights that we had there, uh, I uh, looked around and here comes a guy with a camera, a reporter from Time Magazine. And uh, I says, what are you doing here? He says, I'm gonna take a picture of the next battle. And I said, you're an American citizen. He said, yeah. I said, put down the camera and take a weapon and get in there. And uh, he says, no, I can't. I'm neutral, I'm a reporter. I said, then get the hell out of here. So I chased him away. And uh, so uh, a couple few hours later, the division commander come up, uh, General Brooks, and he says, I want to talk to the officer, I mean, to the NCO that chased the reporter off. And I said, that's me. And he leaned over and he said, good job, Sergeant. He says, <laughs> he says the rule in world and this war is that the reporters stay at division headquarters and we release them to go take the pictures that we want them to take. We do not want them to take pictures of people trying to kill the enemy. I mean, well, you could all imagine what goes on today. It's a disgrace that you have to turn around and here's a guy with a camera and you would wonder whether I should shoot this guy or not. There's seven men still in Leavenworth for doing that because they didn't get permission to shoot the guy before they uh, did it. What kind of what kind of an army is that? We're we're teaching ourselves to be a bunch of wimps. Anyway, excuse me. See, I got off the track. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so uh, we went on through after Pom Procard. A lot of good stories about Pom Procard. But anyway, uh, we went on down through Notre Dame, and then we went to St. Dennis. In St. Dennis, the gas. Uh, we were uh, on one end of town. Uh, set up a roadblock, what we call, we had uh, any tank on with us and so forth, and we set up a roadblock, and somebody else had the north end of town. During the night, they told me, move your men to the north end. And so I says, okay. So on the, while we're running up there, uh, some officer stopped me and says, who are you? And I told him we were 2nd platoon, 41st infantry, and he says, good, go up there and stop them. They, come, they broke in on the north end of town. German tanks for that. So, okay, so I'm, we're running up there and I, I get part way up there and I said to myself, what the hell are you doing? You, know, you, you have nothing but rifles, you got a bunch of men here. Those are German tanks, because we were familiar with them. The first one that rounds the corner, he's gonna fire. I said, get out of here, all of you, leave the street and we'll farm at our half track where we park them in a safe area. So everybody left. I had a problem. I was against the wall, probably almost that high, and I, I couldn't couldn't get out of there. And here's the tank. The German tank comes around the corner. He fires, and the blast from the tank blew me up on the wall and knocked me off on the other side. And I had a, a some uh, fragments in my one leg, and I couldn't walk, so I had to crawl the rest of the night. And so uh, that's how I got wounded the first time. And I always said that besides the blast from the cannon, my guardian angel lifted me up on that wall and got me over on the other side because I couldn't have done it uh, just from the blast. So many people say, Paul, what caliber was the cannon on the German tank? I said, do you think for one damn minute? I stood there waiting for that thing to come and what it is. We had to look at things like that, you know, that was war. So anyway, they, they found me the next day. They said, where is he? And I, I, they said, well, he crawled around all night and wouldn't leave. And we, we set up a new defense and all that. So they took me to the aid station and then they flew me to England. <clears throat> In England, I woke up at the hospital the next morning, and uh, I'm in, in camouflage, of course, yet, and I'm over in this corner, and all the Americans over in another corner, a big room like this. I'm over here by myself, with two MPs by my bed. And so I straightened up, and I said, what the hell's going on here? So the nurses come running over, and they said, he's an American. I said, G.D. Wright. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled the dog tags out and I went like this and I said, you didn't even look to see. They says, no, all we did is cut your pants leg and took the stuff out and left you here to be interrogated because you were the enemy. And so uh, 
with that, I became a, a wild man. I just cussed everybody out. <laughs> so they sent me to two psychiatrists. <laughs> One of them said, you're crazy. And I said, uh, no, I'm not. And, uh, so they sent me to another one, and he says, I don't think you're crazy, but I'm going to do you a favor. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to send you home. I said, oh, no. He said, well, what the hell do you want? I said, those are my guys up there. I'm not going to go home and sit there and uh, listen to the news and wonder what happened to my guys. I said, I'm going to go back to them. He said, you want to go back and get shot at some more? I said, you don't understand that we're brothers and we mean something to each other. He says, well, he says, you're not crazy, but I am going to send you back. So they, uh, I did get back and went to Belgium, France, Belgium, Holland, Germany. And uh, uh, while I was recovering in England, I did have a couple of good times. <laughs> <laughs> I revisited some of the girls. We went to Northern France, Belgium, Holland. Uh, real quickly in Belgium, uh, a young boy came up to me and he, he wanted to join with us and he had a dog. And he must, maybe he 16, 15, something like that. And so I said, fine. So we gave him some clothes and, uh, and he and the dog slept in the holes with us at night and so forth. Went through Belgium and Holland and uh, everything was pretty good. When we got to the German border, the company commanders of Paul he says it's time to let the boy go. We don't want him to go into Germany. And so uh, I had to let him go. We called him Belgic. And I'm always sorry that we didn't get his name and uh, who he was. And I could follow up with him later. But I, I didn't get that opportunity. And I always felt bad about it. We went into Germany. OK, we went into Germany. and. Uh, we were at the Siegfried Line in Germany. Uh, of course, that's the German fortifications. If you remember reading about the Siegfried Line, they had all their pillboxes and so forth. And we had to knock those pillboxes out first. <clears throat> and uh, the main way we did it was with flamethrowers. They equipped us with flamethrowers. The British gave us some flamethrowers. They also gave us a couple of Churchill tanks with flamethrowers. And if we could hit the the slot in the pillbox with the flamethrower, it would take all the air out and they, and they would come running out and then we could shoot them. So uh, that's the way we got them out of the pillboxes. And uh, so we were stuck in that area though because of the weather was so bad. 16 days of rain <coughs> and mud, artillery coming in both directions and, and we were living in a hole in the ground. And, uh, we couldn't move hardly because they had us what they call zeroed in. And so uh, uh, it was pretty hairy during that time. And uh, just before that, we went into Pollenberg on our way up there. And I went into a house with a group of guys. And we always went to the basement to get the German food because it was always better than ours. And uh, uh, sitting in the corner of the basement, uh, I'm sitting there by a big barrel in a shell came through the basement, put a big hole in the wall just above my head, and busted the barrel, and it was sauerkraut. So the sauerkraut went all over me. Boy, <laughs> did I say. And so, no way to change clothes. So then we went to the, uh, went on into the Siegfried Line, and while we're up there, my Lieutenant Woodbury got wounded. He got hit in the temple, and all the blood come flowing out, and got all over me on the other side. So I had sauerkraut on this side and blood on this side. And uh, the very first thing we do is stop the bleeding. So that it had to be done quick in his case because it was on the temple. So all I could think of was reach down and get a handful of mud and slap it on his brain, which is what I did. And, it, and uh, we then took his aid kit and wrapped, his, wrapped it around mud and all and left him there to be picked up. Uh, months later, he wrote me and said that it saved his life. The mud saved his life. And so uh, after that, I told him, I said, if anything else is, happens and uh, anybody else gets hit and there's mud around and they're really bleeding bad, use the mud. It'll stop the bleeding. That's the very first thing you had to do, was stop the bleeding. Um, OK, and then and, uh, there's a lot of stories about the, 
what we did during the six feet line thing about the patrol out setting up booby traps and all that stuff. Oh, incidentally, Patton always said, you don't push spaghetti, you pull it. And uh, in other words, you, you look at, think of spaghetti, and if you get behind a piece of spaghetti and just curl up, well, it won't go anywhere. But if you get in front, you can just take it, take it anywhere. That was one of his favorite sayings. You don't push spaghetti, you pull it. That's how you become a leader. So uh, uh, that, that's one thing that we we always practice very much. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, we we got uh, the 84th Division came in. We got a brief break and got prepared to, to move to the Roar River. So we're we're headed towards the Roar River. And on the way to the Roar River, the Germans had put up uh, barbed wire and all that. Uh, uh, two layers of it, and so we put Bangalore torpedoes in the wire and let them fire down to blow up any mines that were there so the tanks could go through. So I'm putting the uh, Bangalore, again, you pull the spaghetti, so if you didn't lead the way, nobody else wanted to do it. So I, I was usually the one that would run out there and do that. So I put the torpedo out there and uh, put the cap in it and all of that and the charge and was heading back to the hole to set up the charge and on the way back I got hit by artillery fire so I'm laying there and somebody else had to set the charge up so uh, everything went, uh, that was November the 16th, 44 and so uh, <clears throat> uh, the medical man came up and I knew him from the States, Captain Sigenwright, he was a colonel then and uh, he looked at me and he knew me well and he said uh, you, what are you doing here when the front was way up there? And I said, USOB, the front was right here. Where were you? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he was a colonel and we knew each other well and we just laughed and uh, they took care of me. Took me to an air station in Valkenburg, Holland and Valkenburg, Holland, they were bombing it so bad they decided they can't stay here. Now I just had a flesh wound in one leg and so I figured I could recover in Europe and go back to my group. They said no. They put me on a damn C-47 with some other guys, tied us down in a litter and flew us to England. On the way into England we crashed. Uh, <coughs> November, uh, we hit some uh, wires and emergency field and, and the plane crashed. Went in on our nose and, uh, and they got us out and took us to an aid station. One of the best things of the war happened then because four girls we're running that airfield. Uh, but it was four, the four girls that took care of me were part of the girls that took care of the airfield. And so we enjoyed that night very well. And, uh, and uh, as soon as the American Army found out where we were, they got us out of there. And so uh, I went to the aid station, and at the aid station, because I, I wasn't wounded that bad, uh, they, they said, well, uh, well, you'll recover here and we'll get you back. And so the colonel there, Colonel Lee, says that uh, you'll do what I tell you, you don't mean anything to me. Next morning they put me on peel of potatoes, so I'm peel of potatoes. So I'm looking at this potato and this mess sergeant come over to me and he said, let me show you how to peel those potatoes. And I said, how many numbers in your serial number? He said, eight. I said, there are only seven in mine. I said, take this potato and you know what to do with it. <laughs> so I left, I went AWOL. <laughs> they put me on uh, put me on charge for uh, to be court martialed in England. And I'm on my way back to Europe. So I got to the port down there, and we uh, some uh, captain with infantry, brand new men. We we were on our way back to uh, to, uh, to 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 Europe, and uh, on the way back on an LCI, we were out in the English Channel, and we got hit by another ship and got sunk. So now we're sunk in the English Channel. So uh, they got picked us up, and LST picked us up, and we got back up on board of the uh, LST. So the colonel, I mean the captain that uh, was helping me, he says, I didn't do you any favors. He says, because if you had a drowned out there, you would have been a deserter from the American Army, and you would have been treated as a deserter. And here I was trying to get back, but never thinking. Never think right, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, I got to Europe, got on the Red Ball Highway, went back to uh, hitchhike back to my outfit, and uh, got there just before the Battle of Bulge on December the 22nd. 
It started on the 16th, but the, our part of it didn't begin at that time. We were on the way to the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, the Second Armored Division was uh, commissioned to go to the Meuse River and to keep the enemy from crossing the Meuse River and getting to Antwerp to divide the troops in half. A lot of stories about uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, they, uh, <clears throat> on Christmas Day, we fought the Second Panzer Division in the Battle of the Bulge at Sinai in Belgium. And uh, we were able to defeat the Second Panzer Division, who we had fought before. And they were supposed to be a very elite outfit. And uh, we got letters from Eisenhower and from, uh, <coughs> from uh, Montgomery and people like that uh, telling us how much we did, how well we did, and all that stuff, you know. And, uh, but the Battle of the Bulge, in a way, was not as bad for me as the Siegfried Line, because it was worse. But the Battle of the Bulge was cold, and I mean cold, cold, cold. And a lot of guys were having frozen feet and everything else. And at, at one point, I ended up with only seven guys left. And, uh, but uh, most of them were not captured or anything like that, or wounded. They were. Their feet were frozen in that, and they were able to uh, unfreeze them some way and get them back to us. So uh, uh, we did. We did go on then to the Roar River and cross the Roar, and uh, okay, Red Ball Highway to the front. Well, we did that. Go up with it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> it uh, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, you know, the Germans uh, actually were in it in a way longer than we were, than the Second Armored was, because we had been up at the Roar River and we came back 90 miles to the tip of the Bulge to stop them from crossing the Meuse River. And we were supposed to be uh, confidential, who are we and all that, nobody would know until we engaged. One of the German generals <coughs> in the book and in the uh, said uh, we didn't. We thought uh, there must be more than one Second Armored Division because you're supposed to be up at the Roar River, but we had gone 90 miles in one night to get back to the Bulge to beat them, and so uh, we did beat them there. Like I say, Christmas Day, and uh, and we're able to defeat them, and uh, so as a result of that, uh, they began moving back. And you know, a lot of people talk about Bastogne. But what they don't realize about Bastogne, they did a great job. They were holding the enemy out of the roadblock. But Hitler finally woke up and he totally put a new general, German general, in charge. And he says, don't be stopping there at Bastogne, go around it. So he sent two panzer armies around it to head for the Meuse, and that's where we got involved because they found out that they were headed that way and they said, get over there and stop them. Don't let them, don't let them cross the Meuse River. So that's how that happened. And then, of course, you know, Patton came up from the south and uh, relieved Bastogne. But he himself said he just rode in there in a jeep and nobody even fired at him. Because a good part of it, the Bastogne at that point became uh, irrelevant in a way because we'd already uh, cleared the, the thing up there and was chasing them back. So anyway, we went to, we crossed the Roar River, and we went to the Rhine River, and, uh, okay, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much time, we're, we're talking pretty good here, I think. But anyway, at the, at the Rhine River, very interesting thing there was that Adolf Hitler Bridge, and, uh, Actually, uh, the Second Armored Division, our combat command, were the first ones to cross the Rhine. But we didn't get credit for it. Good reason. We got across, and when we got across, they blew the bridges out where we couldn't get our tanks across. So we were over there by ourselves. So General Hines, our combat commander, we were divided into combat groups, and General Hines had us withdraw back across the Rhine uh, so we wouldn't be annihilated on the other side because we didn't, we didn't have any armor with us. So uh, we, we came back, they put us in Crefield, England. A very interesting story about Crefield, England. 
Uh, we were at Crefield. Uh, the people had all left, the German people, so we had the town. So we had some fun there. We, uh, we uh, went into all of the beer joints and uh, drank up whatever there was. Uh, one of the things I did, which I never owned up to, and they, uh, they still don't know today, well, I guess they don't, they, they said it's true, I mean, so one of the reporters checked on it recently with the people in Crefield and the history of Crefield, and I let all the animals out of the zoo. <laughs> destroyed their ammunition factories and all that, and the cologne and all that deal. <clears throat> At that time, they, they farmed what they call a, a spearheads and uh, the breakthroughs. And uh, uh, they divided us into small combat groups, five tanks with a platoon of infantry, uh, that five squads we had, and an armored infantry. And a squad rode at the bank of each, at the back of each tank. We got up on the tanks and rode them until they were fired at. And of course, we jumped off and see what we could do to help them out. And uh, so, uh, anyway, that was very interesting talking to those people in Hollywood. They didn't understand how we operated, and when we told them, they were they were really surprised at how we communicated with the tanks. But anyway. Uh, we communicated with the tanks because the center tank of the five would have a telephone on the back on the outside. <clears throat> and I could go up, or if I had an officer, he could go up and grab the phone and talk to the tank commander of the five <coughs> tanks and tell them where the targets were because they're just looking through this little slot. And so uh, anyway, uh, that was one of our major jobs was to do that. We, uh, uh, took a, a Hitler Youth School. We uh, uh, during this time on the breakthrough, we took a Hitler Youth School, um, and they were off to one side as we're moving on, and they were firing it at us from the rear, and they killed a couple of my men. And uh, I had the guys get up in front, run in front of the tank, and so the tankers went, "What the hell are you doing up here?" And so I told them on the phone, "We're receiving fire from their left, right rear." So they turned the two tanks that were on the right side uh, to fire on the trees and, uh, and kill those kids that were in the trees trying to kill us. And so anyway, we had quite a deal with the Hitler Youth, which is in the book. And, uh, uh, oh, God, he got me on June 13th already. You're a little bit too fat. So, uh, anyway, uh, on the breakthroughs, a couple of things I want to mention real quick. Uh, <coughs> We would go. We would go to a town, and the the people who were, knew war was almost over. They wanted to be halfway decent with us, the German people, because they wanted to save their town. And the mayors would advise us to blow the steeples off the churches, because that's where the artillery observers, the enemy, were, and getting direct fire on us. So uh, we uh, they thought that the American soldiers wouldn't blow up churches, but uh, we had to. Otherwise, uh, we didn't blow the whole church up, we just shot the steeple off. But anyway, uh, and in some of the towns, when we get in there, the mayor would have them put up the white flag and say they surrender, but the German troops that were there before they left town, they would hang the mayor, the German mayor in his office, and we found them out in their office more than a couple of times. Uh, uh, and one other time I need to mention is that we went into a town and they told us if you see a fire, go to the fire right away. And, then, and there was a barn on fire and the SS had put the, the animals and the people who they wanted to get rid of into the barn and lock it and set it on fire with the people in the barn. And that would be uh, uh, Holocaust people, I mean Jewish prisoners that they're trying to move out of our way. Political prisoners, people they didn't like and the animals. They put them all in the barn and lock it. 
and our job was to get to the barn, get it open, and let the people out. So uh, uh, that's what we did. This one time we did that, and then uh, some of the people told us there's a SS colonel that wants to give up. He's hiding in one of the barns over there, over there, and uh, so uh, we went and got him out. The colonel come out, and he says, "I'm a colonel in the SS, and I demand to be treated according to the Geneva Convention." Guess what? We didn't treat him according to the duty of the convention because he was a murderer. He killed all those, tried to kill all those people in the barn, and some of them he was successful. And uh, so the uh, sergeant, a uh, private first class named Archer, on my right side, he hit this colonel right in the mouth and knocked him down. And he leaned over and he says, I'm just a PFC in the American Army, and I don't give a damn if you're a colonel. And I don't give a damn about the Geneva Convention. You're going to do what we tell you. So the people in the town, German people, begged me to turn them over to them. So I decided, well, they're really mad, so I gave them to them. <laughs> they stripped him naked and filled him full of bullet holes and laid him on the side of the road. As we left town the next morning, all of us, as we walked by, we looked at him and we said, great. That's the greatest punishment you could give to a killer. Instead of sending him back to the States and have three meals a day and be treated like an army, a, a German army officer, a colonel, after what he did we, did, we did a lot of things that way because we weren't the cleanest people on earth because we had to get down in the dirt and be dirty too. And uh, the people at West Point, when I was there, couldn't believe the stories. In fact, they didn't even, they didn't even relate some of them. And when they and wouldn't even let us talk to the to the uh, cadets because they didn't want the cadets to know what we actually did. They say you shot prisoners. You did this. You did that. Yes, we did. We and we would. Uh, our answer was you're still here because we did it. That's why you're still here because you have to fight the enemy's battle, not yours, theirs. You got to find out what is their plan and fight their plan, not your plan. Your plan's way up here. Their plan is down here. You better get down there with them or you're going to lose. So that was Patton's theory and that, that's the one we carried through. Uh, <clears throat> we went to the Elbe River. At the Elbe River we were, uh, 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 well we crossed the Elbe River and uh, we couldn't get uh, our tanks to cross again because they kept blowing up everything at Magdeburg. And so uh, we got across, but then we had to withdraw. And uh, uh, and I could, I'll just mention this about it. This was uh, the time Roosevelt was killed, uh, April uh, 12th, I believe it was now. Uh, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> we had to evacuate across, back across the L because they couldn't get anything across. And uh, so, uh, uh, we were, we're going along trying to find a way across and they, I got a call from the other side of the river and uh, with General Hines and he says, I want to talk to your company commander. And I said, you can't, he's dead because he's just been killed. And he says, let me talk to your, your uh, executive officer. I said, you can't. He said, why? He said he was shot in the mouth and we bandaged him up. And uh, he said, well, who in the hell are you? And I said, well, I'm Sergeant Ander. He said, what are you doing there? I said, because guys like you put me here. <laughs> and uh, General Hines, I drove, I rode motorcycle for him in the States as a scout at one time. So we knew each other when he was a major. So, you know, we knew each other well. So anyway, he says, you got to get out of there. And I said, well, what about the people behind us? He says, I, they're evacuated. I said, you mean you left us here by ourselves? And he says, yes. He says, get out. So, uh, we had to send the guys back across so many at a time. And, uh, so when it got done, when me and two other guys were left, and we had to get out of there, and uh, uh, we had some prisoners. And so we shot them. We couldn't have them jump in the water with us because there were more of them than there was of us. They could have just pulled us under. And we would have been drowned, so we shot them. U.S. people that we tell that to couldn't believe it. So anyway, we got on the other side and uh, our artillery was all drunk because Roosevelt died. 
but he couldn't support it. Our own artillery. So, me and the other two guys, we jump on the, the M7 and start beating up the, our own artillery guys with our fists because they were drunk. <laughs> and so they locked us in the house. So, anyway, we, they got us out of the house because the colonel came down from Supreme Headquarters and investigated it. Let us go. And he says, the war is going to be over right away. So, uh, calm down. And so uh, I did calm down some. And, uh, but I no longer was interested in staying in the Army. I was regular Army, but no more for me because they, they treated us like we were cannon fodder. And they didn't care about the infantry. You were there, you were expendable. Just, uh, you know, whatever happened to you happened. That was it. So uh, anyway, I got the German helmet there, uh, shot the last German I shot, his helmet rolled off, and uh, I said, that's mine. I couldn't, I didn't want to get one all through the war, but I couldn't get it. Of course, Kennery won with me uh, as infantry, so uh, I got that one, and I kept that one, and I brought it home. And uh, so uh, when the war ended, uh, they, uh, we were 60 miles from Berlin, and they said, we're not going to have you go into Berlin. And, uh, uh, we're going to let the Russians take Berlin, and you need to read the story about Russians taking Berlin, how they fought each other to see which Russian army would get the credit with Stalin, uh, who took uh, Berlin, and uh, we would have just been in the middle of their fight. So uh, uh, Eisenhower was smart to get us stay out of there until the war was over, and then we moved in. I didn't move in with them because they, wa they wanted me to take a commission and go to Asia, and I said, no. They said, well, what are you going to do? We thought you were a regular army. I said, not anymore. I'm getting out of this damn thing. And so they said, well, what do you want? And I said, I want to go home. I got 132 points, and I'm going home. So they said, well, you sure have enough points, so you're going to go home. So the war ended May the 9th, and I was back home at June the 13th at Jefferson Barracks uh, getting out of the army. They gave me $30 and a car token to get on the bus to go home. And uh, cause that was St. Louis, uh, Jefferson Barracks. And uh, the best thing that ever happened to me, and the best reception I got going home, was on the bus, carrying a barracks bag, and I was uh, limping a little bit, a young girl, she must have been maybe 16, she stood up and she said, Soldier, take my seat. And that floored me. Because that was the best welcoming you could ever have. And I was so sorry that I never, ever got her name in that, but I didn't, I wouldn't take the seat. And that was bad for me to, to do that, not to do it. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, homecoming for those that actually did most of the fighting, we already had enough points, so they sent us home. So most of the guys that were in the parades and doing this, all of this that you see after the war, were the replacements. The guys that actually did the fighting, or the most of them that did, were already home on their points and they didn't get any celebration. Except I got a beautiful one from this young girl. And for that reason I love every one of you. Aww. All you ladies. Because you're passionate. And all the men are nothing but a bunch of nerds. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't have <laughs> uh, I, I got about five minutes, so I'm going to say uh, a couple of things. Uh, something you have to read. Know that there was so many of us, not so many of us, there was just a few of us that fought the 30 months. Because uh, it began in 42 for us in Europe. And because there were so few of us, there's so few left that could tell you the story from Africa, Sicily, and Normandy all the way through. Because uh, the majority of the American forces got involved in D-Day. And you know D-Day, it lasts from June to May, 11 months. And so a lot of the people who fought in Europe only fought maybe 10, 11 months, and some of them only two or three months. So even some of the American soldiers today can't believe what we did, the guys that I talked to that are part of my group, they said, you did this, you did that. We were different because we fought differently. And uh, in our uh, uh, 
newspaper reports uh, during the invasion of that. In the U.S. newspapers, actually we were called Roosevelt's Butchers. I have the, the articles. We were called Roosevelt's Butchers. You could never be called that today. They wouldn't allow it. It's not clean. It's not culture. It's not nice. But if you're not dirty, you're not going to get there. And I'm sorry, we're all Christians. We love God and eat the greatest. And if it wasn't for him, of course, I wouldn't be sitting here. Because and finally, what I tell all the students is smile. Because if you give one, you get one back. And it's the longest word in the dictionary. Because there's a whole S between the word smile. M-I-L-E, that's a mile. So there's a whole mile between the two S's. That's why you smile, because it's so important. And always get up in front and be a leader and don't follow. So many people are followers. Finally, I was asked by one school boy, he raised his hand, one of the wise guys, there's always one. And he said, how do you tell the leader from a follower? And I said, stand up. He stood up. And I, I said, bend over. He bend over. I said, you're a follower. <laughs> he, said, he said, why? I said, because you're standing on your pants legs, and when you bend over, you're showing the crack on your behind. <laughs> so that means you're following somebody. Pull up your pants, get with it, and get in front and be somebody. And some of the teachers said, we could never tell them that. But I always end up telling them that. Amen. Amen. <laughs>